All right, I've got myself a uh, brand new br brass nut uh, that I made for this base. Uh, strung it up with some leftover strings I happen to have and set it up. And it turns out, it's, regardless of how much I'd like to talk crap about the guy who built this, he did set the neck correct. The, it sets up nice and low. As a matter of fact, I could even make the strings too low. Uh, I think the problem was is that um, either the client wasn't aware of how loose the truss rod was or someone he brought it to to try and fix the situation didn't realize that. Once the truss rod was uh, uh, adjusted, which basically pulled the front of the neck back down after the string tension, uh, the strings were nice and even and leveled out just nicely. Uh, and it did play quite well too. So it's a good playing bass. Uh, now that I know that everything is correct about it, uh, now it's time to strip it down and start going all the way down to uh, bare wood. Okay, I've completely stripped the base as much as possible. Every piece of hardware that I can pull off, every little piece of metal anywhere on the base, I have pulled off, ex with the exception of the frets on the fretboard. Uh, the frets look in great condition, so I'm going to do my best to avoid even pulling them off. There's real no reason. They do stick out slightly on the sides, which I'll address as I'm um, sanding the instrument. That'll just come right down and be nice and smooth and flush by the time I'm done. Uh, I've even removed the nut. No reason to keep that in there right now either. <clears throat> as I start sanding, I'm sure I'm going to start finding some horrors. Uh, one I've identified right away. As I was uh, pulling out the electronics, the, the bridge ground wire that goes comes out here and strings through, uh, the guy who built this obviously missed. And uh, it barely comes out right here at the bottom, like right in the corner. And as soon as I saw that, I realized immediately what he had done. He had drilled through the back and then just tried his best to cover it up and then paint it over it. I'm sure that will all come to light as soon as I, uh, you can even see where it happened. I'm sure it will be very obvious once I sand it all down and I'll be forced to do the same thing basically, fill it in and uh, make it disappear. But just what a crap job this guy did. So at this point now, it's time for me to start sanding this instrument down. And uh, because I can't get the neck out, it's stuck in there, El Permanente. Uh, I'm basically treating this as if it were a through body instrument, through neck body instrument, which uh, is what I normally build, so it's uh, not really a problem. The biggest problem with doing a through neck instrument is while uh, carving the neck, really, uh, you want to avoid hitting the horns, but I'm just going to be doing a little sanding around here. I don't have to do any carving at all. I might do a little bit here to adjust the way this looks and give it a a nice clean look like it was meant to be this way. Right right now it's just kind of an embarrassment for whoever owns it. They're kind of like, ugh, I know. <laughs> but um, so what I'm going to do to get the main amount of paint off the body is I'm just going to use a, uh, a sander. And uh, as I start working my way, and as the paint starts disappearing on here, I'll change to a, uh, a hand block, you know, uh, with different grits. And uh, as I start making my way around the instrument on the different curves and stuff, I have different uh, blocks I like to use. I do these for inside curves, such as this, anywhere there's an inside curve. And I always use a flat block on outside curves, like this. An outside curve, all the way around. And on the neck, I have a felt block, which helps, uh, that way it's not as rigid, so when I'm doing the sanding here, it, it uh, conforms the neck a little bit better and it's not so rigid. So I'm going to go ahead and start doing that and uh, try and start pulling this instrument all the way down the bare wood. And as I uh, notice things that I think are interesting, I'll uh, stop and video them. So if you don't see anything until this thing is bare wood, I guess there wasn't nothing interesting, interesting happened. <laughs> all right, well, it turns out, uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I really should have started this in the first place. Heat is usually the best way to start taking off a, a finish as far as stripping it off. And basically, uh, while this finish is still very inferior, I can't get it too warm where it starts to rubberize and then it just smears. It's really weird. Uh, so if I get it just a little warm, I can start to peel it up. See how I get under it? I gotta be careful. And also, this is... Uh, not necessarily uh, that dull, so you got to be careful about getting wood chips too. You know, you don't want to 
to be careful that you don't start scraping underneath a piece of, uh, uh, get under a wood, you know, uh, some of the grain. You got to watch the direction of your grain as you're doing this. So you might pick up a little piece of it and start just take a big chunk of your wood out. So always be very cautious while doing that. And you see, it does peel off pretty good. But I got to be careful because as soon as it starts to get a little rubbery, pull the heat away. In fact, I do it from kind of a distance here. Let's see what I'm doing. Let's go the way around. Okay, so I got it too hot. Let's go over here. And I'll continue to do that until the whole body is uh, stripped for the most part. And all these little pieces like this left over, uh, that's where the, I started catching underneath some of the grain. And I, I kind of just let, let it go. I'll come back with my uh, sander and hit that. And, and then I'll use those blocks I showed you earlier. In the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and continue scraping all this finish up. And then uh, I'll move on to the sides as well. And you got to be really careful while working on the sides because watching this grain, it's easy to catch right underneath it and pull up a chunk. So I'll work this way across the grain so it won't go underneath it until I start coming along this side. Then I'll work that way into the grain. Same thing in this little pocket. I'm going to work that way because if I try and come around in here, I'm going to catch underneath that grain and just pull up a chunk. And this is fairly soft. It looks like alder to me, which is easy to, 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 to chunk up. So... You gotta be careful. If it was maple, it probably wouldn't be su such a problem. But that's, you wouldn't usually have a big, full piece of maple like that. Ash would probably be a little uh, harder and easier to work with and probably wouldn't do it as much. All right, I've uh, managed to get most of it off, off the, the uh, most of the finish off the back and uh, the front. You can see what I was talking about where, uh, well, I I think I covered it up with a vise, yeah, where he came through the wood when he was trying to drill the, let me focus, when he was trying to drill uh, the, the bridge ground stream, uh, uh, stream, the bridge ground wire, and he popped through the back because he wasn't paying attention, and then filled it in with wood filler to hide what he had done. I mean, well, what else could he do? I mean, I would have done the same thing if I'd made that mistake, so. So that's how we fixed that. Now, what I'm going to do is I need to start. Uh, trying to get the sides all down and I'm gonna continue with what I've been using as far as the heat gun <clears throat> And once again, I have to pay attention especially now to the grain uh, as I come down I can come down the grain this way uh, Let's see if I can get it to focus Because of the way it's going and I can go down it But as soon as I start coming up here, you see I start gouging into the grain So I'd have to start coming out this way and that's true as I go all the way around the body. I have to be very careful. This is going to be a very difficult area and uh, will probably be more trouble than anything in these little areas. And I'll probably have to use a lot of sandpaper more than heat. But eventually I will get it. So nothing more to do than just to do, do it to it. And I also, once again, I still have to make sure I don't get it too hot because this paint uh, you know, I sat here and I talked about how crappy the uh, rattle can paints can be. Uh, and I stand by that. Those are pretty terrible paints to use on guitar. But you can do it successfully. I've seen it done. Uh, the, I think the secret to it is is putting on very light coats and making sure those coats are dry before putting on the next coat. Don't try and put on one thick coat. It's very obvious, or at least in my opinion, I think it was very obvious that's what this guy did because uh, it's pretty typical metallic uh, paints like gold, uh, on a previous coat to spray another heavy coat, it'll start pulling up the previous coat that hasn't fully uh, cured yet as the temperature changes and start making all these uh, crack-like effects throughout the finish. And it was like that throughout this whole thing. It just looked like crap. But um, 
it could have been done had he just taken more time. Uh, but regardless of which, I don't recommend using those type of paints. It's better off just go buy yourself some nitrocellulose or uh, polyurethane and get some uh, uh, decent quality stuff. So anyways, time to continue stripping the base down. All right, I'm getting most of it off now. Just a couple uh, spots left. Uh, got most of it out of the, uh, the, the pockets here of the, uh, the, the horns. And uh, you can see that I still got a little bit on the neck left to do. This is just mostly, I, I can't use a, I can't scrape this off with heat. I probably could some, but it's just, it's thin enough that it's easily sanding off. What I wanted to show you here was, uh, this is uh, evidence of rolling off to the side when you're using a sanding block. When uh, sanding with a flat block, you'll avoid this. But this is how I uh, managed to clean up this part of the, the finish that was on there. And because I know this is flat, and when I saw that developing, it was obvious that whoever had sanded this before had tilted the block while trying to do it instead of trying to just keep it flat and level. Uh, I could try and sand this down flat again, but, you know, ultimately I don't want to remove too much material just to make it perfectly flat. That's, that's not really something you're going to see too easily with the eye, but should be avoided as much as possible. I'm going to try and take most, most of it out, but for the most part it's, it's probably going to have a little trace of that left at the edges. The top wasn't so bad. Did a pretty good job up here. But I'm almost there. Now I've just got to continue, uh, finish pulling off all the uh, remaining little pieces of paint and sand it down to a nice uh, smooth grit. Uh, I'll probably go all the way to 320. All right, I've tried to flatten this out as best as I can. And you can see, you see there's still a little bit of finish on the sides here and the edge here, th these two edges. Uh, and uh, even a little bit right there where it should be flat right all the way up to where the edge of that you know, creases or where the edge of that curve is. Uh, I could, of course, continue to sand this down to get all that as flat as possible and uh, take all that out. But uh, when checking, you could probably see that I'd have to take out nearly another sixteenth of an inch. Oh, come on, to get that thing to actually get down low enough. I don't think it's focusing very well but it's hard to tell. But there's no way I'm taking off that much wood on the headstock just to make this flat uh, to fix this guy's screw up. Uh, frankly, uh, it's such a little amount that it's not gonna be real noticeable, but at least the, the main part of it's flat now. So I can go ahead and uh, do whatever I need to do to get the rest of this finish off here and here. And then I'm gonna start working on shaping this little heel area where he glued the neck in see if I can get a better shape. All right, I've effectively stripped the entire base. Um, there's probably little spots here and there, like in this corner here, I haven't quite got all the finish out. And uh, I noticed a little uh, bump over here, you can barely see it right there, it was a little deeper, where uh, he must have been using a robo sander and uh, came in and hit the neck and tried to fill it in. He made a divot in the neck and filled it in. But anyways, I think I've made my point of what a terrible job the guy who did this before did. Um, I'm at a point where I want to do something with this little area since it's glued in and set in there. And I wanted to shape it to where it looked like it, it flowed better. But I don't want to carve this out to make it match the neck because I don't think there'll be enough surface area. Even though this whole thing is glued on, I, I'm, I'm worried that it won't be enough to keep this neck secure. So I thought what I'm going to do is uh, I have plenty of alder that I can use to match this body. And uh, I'm just going to make a little wedge that sits right in here. And I'll shape it out to look like it contours in to a nice, smooth, uh, sloping neck. So that's what I'm going to try and do now. Just go ahead and make a little piece to sit right in there. Okay, so I've cut off a little piece of alder that's just like the body. and uh, But since I've already rounded this some and... Uh, Alder is a really soft wood, so it's easy to, to, to machine or a mill, I guess. So what I've done is now that I have the piece, as far as its width is concerned, uh, before I've chopped down the bottom, chop it down a little lower, I put a little piece of uh, 80 grit sandpaper on the bottom uh, 
so that when I put it to the way I want to glue this on here, that it sits up flat against this part as I push, and then I can push down and try and uh, sand. And basically what I'm trying to do is uh, match this piece, or match this to match the bottom of this piece right here so that it fits a little better. Once I get a fairly decent uh, fit, I'll uh, trim this down a little bit more to match the shape I'm trying to get to match this. And then uh, I'll glue it on and then, and then carve it to shape. And whatever gaps and fills I'll have, then I'll, I'll take a cue from the guy who built this before me and just slap full a bunch of wood filler and hope it doesn't show. <laughs> no, I, I will do some wood filling in areas where I couldn't get a perfect uh, match, but uh, all this will disappear uh, once the whole thing is painted and it's metallic uh, silver. So that's I'm going to try and get that to match up real good now. Okay, I have my block and I've uh, cut it down to size to match the width of the neck since that's what I'm going to be carving to and I've cu uh, cut it down to match the, si the, the height of the flat here. So it'll sit right in there. And I have two clamps. One's going to clamp it from the top so that I have pressure down on this uh, mating surface of the joint. And then I have this clamp set up so I have pressure on this surface of the joint. And uh, I have another piece of wood here so that uh, as I'm clamping, I don't do any damage to the, the fretboard. I'm not so worried about putting a block on the bottom since I'm going to be doing some more uh, sanding and stuff there. And as far as any compression marks, I'm not going to clamp it that hard. Uh, plus, this whole thing is getting painted in opaque metallic silver. But under normal circumstances, whenever you want to show wood, like on this instrument, uh, whenever you're clamping onto wood that you're going to be painting, most of the time you want at least some kind of block there for two reasons. One, it helps, uh, uh, I keep wanting to say expand, but uh, displace the pressure out. Uh, it, you know, uh, evenly disperses pressure that way throughout the, the, uh, the block. And it also helps keep from putting compression marks on your piece of wood. So now that I'm this far, I'm going to go ahead and uh, glue this bad boy in. And once it sets up, start getting ready to carve it. All right, I got it all glued up in there. And I just wanted to show you real quick how I set the clamps up. That's the uh, protector for the fretboard uh, piece. And here's my uh, clamp for putting uh, pressure on the, the joint this way. And here's my clamp for putting pressure on the joint this way. And uh, as it dries up, I'll go through here and clean it up, And uh, but mostly I had to make sure that this didn't slip one way or the other because I wanted to keep it even with the neck. That was my most important, you know, uh, movement I had to worry about. This keeping it in is really the only thing I had to worry about is from side to side. But it's sitting there nice and pretty and it's uh, firming up and it, it, the joint will be solid within an hour, but um, well, at least uh, set well enough to where I can unclamp these within an hour. But more than likely, I'm going to let this dry 24 hours. I'm going to let it go ahead and go overnight and uh, before I start carving on it. But the idea of why I put this block on here is so that I can carve it to look more like, uh, like a neck joint like this. Where this is obviously a through neck body, what I want to do is create something that's a little bit more gentle sloping. And that little chunk of wood that I stuck here will give me that opportunity to carve that into the rest of the round of the neck from this square. All right, well, I've got this uh, glued on there pretty good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start shaping it now using a uh, series of uh, files and chisels to start getting it close to the shape I want. And uh, it hasn't been 24 hours yet since I've let put this on there. Actually, it's only been a couple hours, but it's on there good enough to where I can start shaping it down pretty close, and uh, I'll probably finish the final shaping on it by the time this is uh, dry or completely cured, which will be 24 hours. In the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and start knocking off the main bulk of this piece right here and start shaping it a bit. All right, so what I've been doing now is I've been shaping it the heel of this area, or what's at the heel of the neck, but where this pocket was, is what I'm trying to do is shape this to make it look more like it's a continue, one continuous piece. Um, it's still got a lot of overhang on. Let's see if I can get it to focus a little better and get some more light. But 
still got a little bit of an overhang there and there, but that's all right. At this point, what I'm doing now is I've got it pretty flush here, but now I need to get this all the way down to the neck and then work that final angle and smooth it all out. I've also, you can see that there's some pretty fairly big grooves here or uh, gaps. Uh, that's not that big of a deal, this here, but this one was too big, so I actually cut it out to be, it was so rounded that I flattened it. I cut it in to be more of a chamfer, straight line, and I'm going to shape a little piece of wood, stick it in there, and glue it in, and then I'll shave it flat as well. I have thought about trying to do that in this little gap, and I may try, but uh, this is my main concern here. That little bit of uh, a gap there with wood uh, filler in it, I don't think will show up. It might, but I'm, I'd like to do my best to keep that from happening, so I'll think about it more as I go along. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and try and finish shaping this up a little bit. All right, well, I got a little excited and got ahead of myself. Uh, as uh, you can imagine, it's tough to try and remember to stop and video for every time you want to do something to show what you're doing next. And uh, that's what I did. I got excited and I put that wedge of wood in and then decided that uh, I was going to, I got some wood filler and kind of watered it down good and wanted to see how far I can get the seat down the cracks. And uh, it did what I wanted it to do. It split a little here and stuff at that one seam I was talking about, which is what I expected. And kind of, it's going to serve as kind of a nice little guide as I start uh, shaping the last part of this. I'm going to sand it all down first before I start resuming with the big uh, heavy files and chisels to start getting this shape in. But uh, I still have to go around the whole instrument yet and fill in the rest of the holes. I got a few done. But you know, here, you know, the last of these, most of these will stay. That, uh, one of these holes was an accident, probably both, I think that one was an accident. It looks like what happened wasn't that he missed where to put the bridge. It, it, once I inspected it, it looks more like uh, the screwdriver slipped off and boop, and he gouged into the wood. That happens. It sucks, but uh, in little spots like this where I just uh, want to hide any areas that uh, unnecessary holes, these will stay since we're still using the same plate. But I'm going to go ahead and start uh, continuing on, and uh, I'll try to remember to keep making videos as I progress. Right, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is start sanding this down, make it flush, and kind of show where all the seams are of everything is. Okay, now that I've sanded away uh, all that excess of um, wood filler, you can kind of see where it went in the low spots that are in there. Um, uh, you could also see that little uh, square chip or uh, wedge that I was talking about putting in earlier also here. That filled in nicely. But it also it reveals the low spots. There was a, a, a low area right here just underneath the neck, you know, and you can see that. And, uh, you know, after blowing it all out, you can see the air holes that are still there because this wood is still actually overhanging. It's trying to fill in. And I'll have to put some more in this area to try and make this transition smoother. You can see it is working over here. I've smoothed out this transition much more, but it's going to take a little bit more. This isn't what I would consider final stage anyway, since I'm just mostly using 80 grit around the whole body. When I start getting down to the final uh, the 220, 320 grit, that's when I'll worry about trying to make this, uh, this all this area as smooth you know, as possible. Uh, the other only danger I have to really worry about is as I'm working this piece down, uh, as I get close to the neck, uh, Alder is much softer than maple, and so I don't really want to sand or mark on this at all as much as possible, just avoid it altogether. But there's going to be some overlap, and I just have to, you have to be aware that the two woods will sand differently, being that this is a softer wood than this. So at this point, now that I can see where I'm going, you know, uh, I was thinking about trying to leave it a bit of a bump like this, you know, kind of follow the shape. But I'm still thinking about trying to uh, maybe instead still curve it out some because I want to be able to have easy access. And you definitely increase the mass of the neck at this point for, you know, access to these registers. To have a little less would be nice. So I think I'm going to kind of cup it out like I did on uh, my base, what I was showing earlier on the through neck. So 
I'm going to go ahead and continue on to do that. Uh, oh, that's also why uh, you could see where these were in the paint because uh, you're looking at end grain on these dowels. Even though it might have been a soft wood like this alder, the end grain is facing on, on here. The end grain's on the end. So the end grain stands differently than the side. And so uh, as those dowels were put in there, they didn't sand evenly. It wasn't a smooth surface, so it showed. And even so, there's a coefficient of expansion that is different between the two woods as they uh, expand and contract due to heat and humidity. So even if after I get this as smooth as possible with the wood filler and everything and take care to try and uh, keep from any shrinkage from anything, there's still going to be telltale signs of the, the two mating surfaces because of the coefficient of expansion. And that's evident between uh, end grain and the side. So no matter how much I work this, uh, you may still see it. Of course, since, uh, uh, since I have been doing this project, I've been talking to the client. And he's decided that the paisley paper that's going on the front, he, since we have two sheets, we're also going to stick the other sheet on the back. So that will probably be big enough to, well, I know it will, because it'll get most of this horn. So it'll cover this area, and I'll be able to, uh, uh, you won't see that now. I also don't have to worry about, you know, little areas like this, where the, uh, the previous guy working on this drilled through by accident. So, anyways, onward. Okay, I've been working on this for a couple hours, and I've uh, shaped it with the files. Uh, pretty much how I like it. It has a nice contour. It's blending in well with the neck now. Uh, there's a few spots I'll still have to um, uh, wood fill a little bit to get that final blend, but uh, it's doing really good now uh, here on the side. And you can uh, you see where one of the you know s s uh, dowels went in for where the screw holes. I've actually cut in here. Um, Past, I don't know if you can see where I put that little uh, wedge in or not, since I've cut pretty far into the neck. Oh, come on, focus. So, um, but I've actually, uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I've actually cut into the neck itself. And um, these are some safe spots to do it because it's where the neck was flat. But I did work a little bit in this area too, which I wouldn't recommend unless you have experience carving necks. Uh, the main danger is is that when, you, when you're really carving in your neck, you want to avoid putting a dip in there. And uh, it almost looks like there is one in the, in the light here, but it does jo uh, gently slope in. So now I'm going to just continue. Uh, I'm done with my rough shaping with the files. I'm going to continue uh, uh, with the sandpaper now. I'm going to shape this in and get it as smooth as possible. And uh, I'm also going to try and blend the top in a little better by using a flat block. And uh, I'll take work 80 grit paper here at first. And I might, uh, excuse me, take it all the way down to 150 before uh, starting to put in the wood filler again. And then uh, with a 220, I'll take all the wood filler out and stuff. And then maybe go over one more time if I find any air holes and stuff I want to fill with a really... Um, thin coat of wood filler and then do the whole uh, instrument in uh, 320. But right now I'm going to go ahead and start with the sandpaper at 80 grit and uh, start doing my final uh, uh, cleanup. I would say it's pretty much shaped where I want so I wouldn't call it shaping but uh, definitely refining the shape now. So after some consideration while I was sanding this I uh, looked at it and what happened was is when the guy who originally built this what he did, he tried doing some contouring himself, and he took, uh, made this part lower. He shaved kind of down into it, but then when he got here, he just kind of shaped it into this almost little bowl area here, um, which is okay. What I'm going to do, though, to try and make it look a little more pleasing is I'm going to carve uh, the wood down to make this uh, bottom horn a little thinner so that it will kind of match what was going on with the rest of this carve here. And then that bowl area, I'm going to try and match into make it look more like it's flowing in one line. You know, a nice curve flow into there. I'm going to try and just hog out wood, and then I'll sand that kind of sculpted in there. And it'll make it look nice in the long run.
in the meantime, I thought I'd go ahead and share what I'm going to do with that here to try and fix that little, it looks a little odd, it, kind of, it looks like a mistake, and uh, it's probably what he meant to do, but it, it just doesn't look good, so this is going to be my fix for that to try and get a line of where uh, this flat here breaks down into the slope, but to follow kind of a, almost like a, a fender-ish of a car type line to where it'll follow this out into and kind of S-curve up into this top corner to follow those two lines. And that's my idea. All right, so I've been sanding on this uh, pretty continuously. I've filled in uh, the areas that I think needed some wood filler so I can uh, feather this in to look more closely like it's uh, going to be uh, through body neck once it's all painted. And it's come out pretty good. It's looking great. Um, I did get a couple of little air holes. They're not that significant, and I don't know if I'd be able to focus. Yeah, there's uh, one right there. And you can see I'm wearing gloves, because uh, at this point, uh, my hands get dirty. I mean, anybody's hands would as they're sanding, and uh, I don't want to leave stains on the wood. Uh, to be honest, it doesn't really matter on this particular instrument. It's kind of a habit of mine. Uh, because the whole thing's being painted, it's, uh, so it doesn't matter if I leave any blemishes on the wood as far as uh, uh, something you can see visually. I don't want to leave any grit that you can feel. I want this to be as smooth as possible, but um, it's just a habit, uh, just in case. Right now, uh, I'm thinking, because the client decided we have two pieces of uh, paisley paper. We're going to put one on top, and he went ahead and decided, uh, as this project was uh, progressing, that he'd like to go ahead and put the second one on the bottom. Now, there's no way I'll get the paper to fold down into this little crease, this little uh, contour curve, without making um, it'll wrinkle. Uh, you just won't get it flat enough uh, because it is a paper as opposed to some kind of... I've seen some uh, paisleys, uh, people doing reproduction paisleys that some have almost like a, uh, a film that stretches it easier. But even, even so, they're only putting it on the top like a traditional paisley, and as you can see on the top, the only place where it, it you know, on at least on this one, it, it only has this contour curve here, which is not a problem. It's a, it's a straight, easy curve. It's not like a, a bowl, which would definitely um, wrinkle the paper. And also, most tellies, when they were pink paisleyed, uh, they're flat, as you are probably aware of. So I've. I want to fill in that little hole, even though it's not that important, but um, precision is paramount to me, especially after making fun of the guy who did the original job of this. Uh, and I also have a couple little dings that are in the back still that would take more sanding. Uh, I don't want to sand off that much material to get down to the little dings that are in here. So I'm just going to, I must have missed them when I did my original little fill, so I'm going to go ahead and do that and mix up a really um, a thin uh, set a thin mixture of um, wood filler and get the little hole here and I think I have another one somewhere else. So the reason I was talking about uh, this little contour here uh, besides the fact that the paper would wrinkle up in there is that what I plan to do is uh, as the paper sits here I'm gonna cut that piece of the paper out of there and hopefully that will give me enough to be able to stick on the headstock to uh, at least on the front side. I'm not going to do the back to continue that paisley design. Uh, and it'll be a little bit of a challenge because of, uh, well, not so much because I'm going up this little ramp here, but I want to make sure that I don't get, uh, you know, I can't block off this hole here, and then when I cut out to match it, I, it has to look very nice or it could look disastrous, like a mistake. So that's what I'm aiming for right now, I'm at that point, but we'll deal that with that in uh, the next section of this, vi you know, the part two of this video, or part three, I should say, when I'm actually starting to apply the finish. But I'm very close to the finish of uh, getting this ready and prepared for the finish. So right now, at this point, I'm just going to continue to sand on it a little bit to make it as smooth as possible. I've already been using the blocks. Uh, I've been down to 220 already, and I've been using um, the felt block mostly in the curve of the contour curve and on the back of the neck and I've been using the, the, the flat blocks to, uh, to do my best to make sure that these uh, dowels are flat. If I were to use the, um, the, 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 the felt block 
what could happen is that because the dowels being ingrained and, and also they're a harder wood than the alder here, uh, the wood around it will sand down faster than the, uh, the, the dowels themselves. So using a flat block forces flatness to happen there. And hopefully I'll have it flat enough to where even if there is a small amount of what I call the coefficient of expansion between the two types of wood, that even so, after it's covered with the paisley paper and uh, then painted, hopefully that will be enough to not have it appear, that you won't be able to see it in the future. Uh, of course, I won't know for sure until uh, later down the road, and even then, that's if the client's willing to tell me about it. <laughs> uh, chances are I may see this base again in the future, in a couple of years, uh, just to have it come in and adjust it and stuff like that. And plus, I got a pretty good relationship with this uh, new client, turning into a pretty good uh, friend. So uh, most likely, I will see this base again in the future. So I'm very curious to see how this works out with the dowels and how well I was able to hide the uh, difference in uh, the wood there as far as uh, the expansion and it showing through the finish. So I'm going to go ahead and do that uh, fill and continue sanding, and I should be done pretty soon. All right, so um, what I did, as I was saying, I was going to fill some of these little holes that I found along here. But what I did first is, while holding the instrument up against the light to see, you know, kind of a sheen uh, as much as possible to reveal any holes or divots I could find. And then as I went around looking for that, I circled them in pencil. So as you can see, I've only done the back side, and i got to make sure that these dry well enough before turning the instrument over, because otherwise then I just, <laughs> I'm going to, well, I'm going to put that, that stuff, uh, filler into my uh, carpet, and uh, I also risk uh, wiping it off. So, but I'm going to let this dry, and then as it does, I'll, work my way around to the front side and you can see where I got a couple pencil marks there and uh, got one right there at the at the curve and I also have some on the edges too although uh, there's one right there so I can get it to focus you know, spots like this so I'm just trying to be very diligent and look for any spots that need uh, a little extra filling and just to be extra cautious because of where the dowels went in here, there could be little cracks that aren't very visible because they filled in with sawdust. I went ahead and uh, tried to blow them out and then re-spackled uh, them basically with wood filler and I'll go back over it again. At this point, once this all dries up and I do uh, both sides and around the whole instrument and stuff, uh, I'll go uh, lightly with 220 over the whole instrument to bring all these fills in nice and level. I'm not really looking to sand in the wood anymore. I'm, I'm just looking to make everything nice and level and look good. So that's uh, what I'm going to continue to do. Okay, so I've gone around and I've uh, filled in every little uh, dent and uh, hole I can find on this thing. As you can see, I found several all around. And then uh, sanded them down flat and flush. I haven't managed to get in where the uh, neck joint was to try and make a nice uh, flush contour to make it appear as if it's just one piece of wood that's been uh, like a through neck body or even a set neck. Uh, and technically I guess you could say it is a set neck since somebody did glue the neck into the body. But I've, been in, I've filled in all the gaps and made it look uh, like it's one, one piece. Uh, at this point, uh, although the instrument doesn't look perfect at this point, you know, it doesn't look all that great because it's exposing all the blemishes that are wrong with it, uh, it's about to look a whole lot better. At this point, I'm finishing, finished with the uh, prep stage, and I'm going to start uh, putting the paisley on it, and that's going to start in the next video. I've already uh, sanded everything down to 220, uh, and in some spots even 320. Uh, you're never going to see the difference between the two sands uh, after the paint's on there. Uh, 320 is plenty, especially since it's going to be an opaque paint uh, with a, a paper cover on both sides of the instrument. So at this point, uh, it's ready to start the uh, finish process.